We're in uh, Matthew 5, the Beatitudes. Anyone have their Beatitude card with them? There may be one on the seat next to you. Anyone been praying these this week? Yeah. Woo! Oh, man. Make sure you get a card before you leave. Let's pray these. (laughs) You guys are great. Uh, We've got some stories to share about what's been happening in the prayer room. Uh, regarding the Beatitudes here shortly. But before we jump into the message, you know, we like to pray for a local church in our area. And so today we're actually praying for Mission Church in Vacaville, uh, Pastor David and Deborah Crone, and uh, all that they're doing out there just in the supernatural and the prophetic uh, and healing rooms and healing prayer. Let's, uh, Vacaville would be this way. Let's stretch our hands towards Vacaville as they're probably gathering in worship right now. And we're going to pray that God would meet them in that room, that the supernatural would happen. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the team there at Mission Church. We thank you for the calling that you have over them, the specific call in the supernatural, the prophetic. And God, we pray today that today would be unlike any other Sunday. God, that the supernatural would absolutely happen, that it would be unquestionable that you were there presently in that space. God, that people would come to know you, that healing would fall and peace would rest over that room. And God, we pray over our church today, here, online, and in San Francisco, that the word of God would go forth with power and clarity. God, would you teach us how to be like you? In Jesus' name, and we all said, amen. Man. Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Some texts say children of God. Here's here's what I want to do. I want to do like a little history lesson so we understand the gravity of what's happening here. Blessed are the peacemakers. This is the era or the time that we would call Pax Romana, which was like a 200-year reign where Rome like ruled over everything. And so when they say Pax Romana, what that literally means is Roman peace. And Roman peace wasn't created by being peaceable with people. Roman peace was taken by force. And so anytime a Jew would come and say, man, we've got to fight against this, the Romans would come and just like squish them like a bug. This was Roman peace. This was Pax Romana. We're going to take peace by force. And then you have this Jew from, this Jew comes in as everyone's saying peace by force. And he's saying, no, blessed are the peacemakers, for they would be called children of God. Now, you have to imagine as a Jew in that time, hearing someone say, blessed are the peacemakers. And your context, all you know about peace is that it's taken by force. I don't know about you, but I'd be confused. Like, hold on, you're saying, you're saying they're blessed? They're taking over the entire world. At that time, Rome controlled much of what we know as earth. And now Jesus is coming and saying, blessed are the peacemakers. Well, that doesn't make sense because they've been ruling by force. Maybe you've come in here and as we talk about peace, you're like, man, bless, peace, what's Peace. I don't get it. I don't know what peace is because right now in my life, I, I don't feel peace. I, don't, I, don't, I can't even place where peace is. Here's my prayer, is that through the message, the Holy Spirit would reveal to you that there is a peace to be had. Even in the midst of what feels like chaos and a storm, there is peace to be had. And peace has a name, and his name is Jesus. And so as we go through, I want to connect the dots with you to show you how peace can be held Like, you can tangibly have peace. And so they're coming in. Jesus is saying, blessed are the peacemakers. See, what the Jews understood of peace was shalom, which it doesn't mean that there's no issues in my life or there's no hard things, but shalom just means everything is complete. There's a a fulfillment. Everything is made whole. That's peace. And so you can actually have peace in a really challenging time of life. Because peace isn't the absence of an issue or a challenge. Peace is wholeness and healing. And so, we're coming into the Beatitudes. Jesus first says, 
Blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they shall see God. And then he says, blessed are the peacemakers. Order in the Bible is really important. What comes first, it's important to understand why things come first and why there's a progression. Blessed are the pure in heart is the very first one because without a humility and a brokenness inside of us, none of these other beatitudes even make sense. There's no way we can be peacemakers if we don't first acknowledge that we can't do anything apart from him. And so order in the Beatitudes is important. So he says, blessed are the pure in heart, and then blessed are the peacemakers. And this is why. Our, our purity in motive and ideology is what should spur our heart into action of making peace. Let me try to explain it like this. We cannot be peacemakers apart from God. It actually requires our submission and our yielding to God and the Holy Spirit before we action into what we think is making peace. Peacemaking apart from God is called legalism. Legalism is my action before submitting or yielding to a holy God. That's called legalism. And so when we see things happen on the news and in media, and it stirs something inside of us, and we don't first go to God in prayer and say, God, what do you think about this? And instead, we find ourselves out in all of these protests and, and parts of these different movements without yielding ourselves to God first. I would ask myself, God, are you okay with this? God, are you okay that I'm taking action before, before first submitting myself to you? God, is, is, this what, is this what you've actually called me to do? Or should I first come to you in prayer and submit my intentions and my motives to you and my agenda to you and then have courage to be obedient to what you're actually calling me to do? See, peacemaking starts in prayer. To receive God's heart, and then to receive God's steps, and then to do what God has called you to do. If you're a person of prayer, you are a peacemaker. But it all has to start at the heart of God. It doesn't start at your personal convictions. It doesn't start at what you think is right. It doesn't start at what you think is fair or just. It starts at the heart of God. I don't know how many stories I can tell you during the pandemic where pastors, local pastors would reach out to me and they'd say, Austin, like, I'm getting so much pressure from my church to do something or say something about this. And I don't think God has given me the green light to actually say anything about this. Even myself, during the pandemic and a whole litany of things we went to, through as people, I was getting messages left, right, and center. Austin, why haven't you said anything about this? Austin, why haven't you posted about this online? And I just tell them, like, I don't know that the Holy Spirit has told me that I should. Because if I go and I do that, which could be right, I just don't know that this is the heart of God and that this is what God is leading me to. See, peacemaking has to start at God's heart. Now, I know a lot of us, we see something happen and we want to spring into action. I know, I get it. I am naturally a problem issue. Let's fix it. I'm like, like a fix it Felix from Wreck It Ralph. I'll just tap my little gold hammer and fix everything. But being a peacemaker requires a patience and a walking with the Holy Spirit and a fighting against our flesh that wants us to do before yielding. And my ask of you, experienced church, is that we would take the posture of humility to say, yet not as I will, but as you will. God, you know better than I do. And my human mind can't comprehend the wisdom it requires to navigate through such difficult and complex situations. And so I actually need your wisdom and discernment, God. Now, I can do a lot of things. I a lot of things. But I don't want to do a lot of things. I want to do the things that honor God. It may not look 
like Christians do a bunch online and in the media. But I would ask the media to then show the pictures and the videos of the prayer rooms of the churches that are interceding for these things that are happening in our world. It doesn't look like it because the media won't post that every week at 12 p.m. we have a prayer room right here in this building and we're interceding for the local things that are happening here. The media won't cover that Experienced Church started this thing called Pray the Bay where we're literally rallying the troops across the Bay Area to intercede for revival. But if there's going to be any work that I'm known for, any work, I want it to be known as the work that we've done in the prayer room on our face before God. That's the work that matters. You want to be a peacemaker. It has to start in prayer. See, there's personal peacemaking. It's the peace between family members, coworkers, neighbors. It's what Paul would call the ministry of reconciliation in 2 Corinthians 5, that we've literally been given this message to be peaceable with other people. Not that there's an absence of conflict, but we bring them to wholeness and healing. And so there's this personal peacemaking that has to happen. Here's what's hard. We're just proud. We're just proud. It's really hard to be humble in a situation and not fight for who's right or wrong, but to fight for a reconciled relationship. It's hard because we're just proud. Like, what if I lose? Listen, if you're thinking about what if you lose, you've already lost. The win is not that someone is the winner or the loser. The win is that people are reconciled to Jesus and then reconciled to each other. And so there's a personal peacemaking that ought to happen. Here's what it looks like when we uh, avoid peacemaking. Let's say we're, uh, let's say Safeway's right here, Costco's here. You ever go to the grocery store and there's like, you know that person that, you don't necessarily not like them. You just don't want to engage in conversation with them. You know, like you go down aisle four and you're walking your little stroller, shopping cart, and then you see them at the end of the aisle and you go, oh, nope, I just needed milk. <laughs> and there's milk in your shopping cart. <laughs> you know those, those people? Or like, you go to a family party, and then for, for Filipinos, it's always that one aunt. It's, there's always an auntie. That one week will be like, oh, you need to eat more. You need to eat more. You don't eat enough. You're getting skinny. And then the next week at the family party, they go, oh, oh you eat too much. You need to eat less. Don't eat so much. <laughs> or the, it's, why is it always the aunties? Where they're like, oh, do you have a boyfriend yet? Oh, you need a boyfriend. Why don't you have a boyfriend? How come you don't have a boyfriend? Why are you so lonely? And then the next week, I won't even go there. We love all of our aunties and all the Lolas. But you know, that we all have that person. That person that's just kind of like, I just would rather not talk to you. Here's what we're going to do. Say law moment at Experience Church. We like to pause and consider the content that we're going through. This ought to be fun. Church Online, you can do this as well. Here we go. Here's our say law question. Is there a person in your life that you try to avoid? And if so, why? Why is And if it's the person next to you, just make up a story. Just make, make up an ambiguous fictional character. Come on, let's take two minutes. Say law question. Is there a person you try to avoid and why? Sin anymore. Whoa. 
And should I fall in the space between where I used to be and this reckoning? Either way, I will bow to the things of this world. And I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding what power sets me free? There is a grave that holds nobody And now the power is in me And I can see the light All right, that must have been the loudest Selah moment we've ever had in the history of Experienced Church. I've never seen people move so fast to get to the Selah moment than just now. That was quick. You guys were talking before I even finished the question. You're like, let me tell you guys. Let me tell you about my auntie. She told me. <laughs> oh, I love it. See, what this beatitude does is it actually invites us to move from dividing to embracing. And not even that we intentionally divide or cause division, but we have just by our posture of saying, ah, oh, I just don't want to be around them. I just don't want to talk to them. Ah, oh, to them again. Here they come. Romans 12 17 through 18 says, repay no, evil, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceful, peaceably with all. This is the same idea of uh, Matthew 5 where Jesus says, turn the other cheek, which a lot of times is misunderstood. A lot of people think, oh, if someone metaphorically smacks you on one cheek, turn the other cheek so they can do it to that one again. Like, that's usually what we interpret this verse to mean. But that's not at all what it means. What Jesus is saying is, he's saying, hey, that may have happened to you. Here's your responsibility as a Christian. Turn the other cheek, meaning to re-offer relationship. They may have done something difficult to you. They may have betrayed your trust. They may have done something that you could never imagine someone having done to you, but here's the challenge. Christians, church, turn the other cheek, re-offer relationship. Not as to say that it didn't happen, but as to say what's honoring to God is reconciliation. And if I'm going to honor God with my life and be a peacemaker, I have to ask God to do the work inside of my heart so I can honestly and earnestly re-offer relationship to someone who might have done me wrong. So here's how you can practice personal peacemaking. Prayerfully move towards the people that you've been trying to avoid. Prayerfully consider moving towards the people that you've tried to avoid. Here's one way you can do it. Pray for them. And don't let your prayers be something like, Lord, would you just change them? <laughs> would you... <laughs> God, would you just make them humble? Jeez. God, would you cause them not to talk? About... No, no, your, your prayer for them is, God, would you capture their heart again? You pray for that person the same way that you would want someone to pray for you. God, would you reveal yourself to them? Let's do this 20 seconds right now where we are. You don't have to do it out loud. But 20 seconds, let's pray for that person that we were just talking about. <laughs> 20 seconds, here we go. Now, I know that can be difficult. I know sometimes for me, my only prayer for them is, God, you got to help me. You got to help me because I, I know reconciliation is what you want. You want, you want us to be peacemakers, but you got to help me because I'm having a hard time. Here's what I've learned. The more I pray for people, I don't ever not like them more. God always grows my heart for people as I continue to pray for them. And so our practical personal peacemaking step is to prayerfully move towards those people 
in your life. And then there's community peacemaking. Community peacemaking is hard because it involves a lot of people. It probably involves people groups that you wouldn't necessarily associate yourself with. Community peacemaking looks like having a posture of listening to and serving and loving maybe the poor or moving towards the homeless or asking questions and carefully considering how you can serve those in the LGBTQIA plus community or wondering, God, how do I walk with people who have different political ideologies than me? God, how do I live in community with those who are in a different socioeconomic class than I am? God, how do I interact with those who have a different upbringing than me? A different, they come from a different background. How do I, God, how do I live as the church with a big group of people in community? And we're all supposed to like each other. That's hard, God. It is hard. It's very difficult. And here's something super practical. Just ask questions. Listen. Just ask questions and listen. Here's a good question you can ask someone. A really good question you can ask someone is, hey, how can I love you? What can I do? How can I be there for you? You can ask people, what's been going on in life? And then just listen. Here's the hardest part as people. It's the listening part. Anyone good at asking questions? I'm pretty good at asking questions. Anyone really good at listening? There was like two hands that went up. <laughs> it's hard. It's especially hard to listen in community when people's lives aren't necessarily the same as yours or things don't look the same as yours. And so our practical peacemaking in community is just that. Prayerfully listen and ask. There's personal peacemaking there's communal peacemaking. There's even regional peacemaking that we ought to consider. Like, how do I become a peacemaker in the Bay Area? Because that just feels overwhelming. And how do I be a peacemaker, not necessarily a tolerator? A lot of us define peacemaking as being tolerant. As long as I don't ruffle any feathers then we've made peace. As long as we don't have opposing ideas, we made peace. We're just gonna let that thing slide and just sweep it under the rug. Because if we talk about it, I don't know if that's making peace. In the Bay Area, we've got a lot of people, a whole lot of different ideas about what truth is and what truth isn't. We have a whole individualistic society and culture that empowers you do you and like leave me alone. We have a whole group of people who have elevated this idea of me just living out my own life, pursuing what I want with my agenda and my selfish ambitions as the highest priority in their lives. So God, how do we live in community with the whole region of people? Isaiah 61 says this, and this is the prophetic promise of the church or the people of God becoming peacemakers in their cities. This is us, church. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. This is God's vision for the church in the local region of the Bay Area. This is the instruction, Jeremiah 29, 7. Seek peace and prosperity of the city you live in. In another translation, Jeremiah, 9, 20, Jeremiah 27, 9 says, seek the, well for, seek the welfare of the city which I sent you. Because in their welfare, you will find your welfare. Here's our, our responsibility. As the church, our responsibility is to pray for the city that we live in. Let me take it a step further. If we believe that God is sovereign and he knows all things 
from the end to the beginning. Our responsibility is to pray for the city in which God has sent us to. How many people in here daily, you pray for the city of Fairfield? How many of us daily, we pray for the city of Vallejo all the time? Top of my list. How many of us are daily praying for the city of Vacaville or Sassoon or Benicia? Daily, like this is just what we do. We got one person who prays for these cities. That's a good start. But our responsibility as peacemakers is to seek the welfare in the city of which we were sent. Because in their welfare, you will find your welfare. You know how long I spent praying for the city of Vallejo as I just heard about what's happened with the city and the local law enforcement. Like, there's a lot happening. It would be crazy to see a group of Christians stand up and pray for the city of Vallejo. It would be crazy because it's not normal for us. It ought to be normal. It ought to be normal for us to pray for our local politics and our local government. It, would, it should be normal for us to even know who our mayor is and who our city council men and women are. It should be normal for us to know these things. How can we pray for a city that we were sent to without knowing who to pray for and without knowing the issues that we ought to pray for? Seek the welfare of the city of which you were sent because in its welfare, you will find your welfare. And so practical peacemaking regionally can be praying for our local offices and it can also be things like volunteering. As simple as that volunteering for the food bank that's right off of Highway 12, volunteering for the homeless shelter, volunteering in all of these nonprofits that where you can make a difference in our community and in our region. This is us being peacemakers. This is what we were called to do. What I found is as you go on this journey of first in the Beatitudes, of first finding yourself poor in spirit so that you can submit to all of these other Beatitudes, this is what naturally happens. We start spending time with Jesus to just be with him. We start becoming more like him. And then we start doing the things that he actually did. This is our call. Peacemaking is doing the stuff that Jesus did. Jesus going into different cities, traveling into different places and making peace. That was his message. Going into places where he was unfamiliar, maybe where he wasn't even invited, and doing the work of the Father. I love this story in Acts 4. As Peter and John are doing the work of the Father, and they're arrested for praying for people. And the Bible actually says that people recognized their boldness like they had been with Jesus. Here's my dream as a church. I wish people would look at Experience Church and say, oh, they've been with Jesus. I can tell by how they're making peace in their community. They've been with Jesus. Man, that's a tough conversation they just had. To reconcile each other, they must have been with Jesus to be that bold. Man, look at that church serving the city of Vallejo for Dignity Day in the beginning of September. Shameless plug. Man. They must have been with Jesus because it's not normal for people to go outside of their comfort zone and to serve others. You want to be a peacemaker. It starts first with our submission to God and his heart, hearing from him what he wants us to do and having the courage to be obedient to then follow him. Here's what peacemaking is not. It is not ignorance. You can't just turn a blind eye from something and say, oh, it's peaceable because I don't have to deal with it. Oh, the, the homeless community. I just, I, just drive the, I just drive around. Then I don't have to deal with it. Then it's peaceable for me. Avoidance. Knowing that it's there, but refusing to accept that it's a real issue. That's not peacemaking. That's just avoiding it. Peacemaking is not passive. It's not just letting it be to see something but do nothing. That's not peacemaking. That's called tolerance. 
And peacemaking is not weakness or being a pushover. It's not letting problems sit because you don't want confrontation. Peacemaking is seeking out what is right in the eyes of God and reconciling people to him and to each other. And so here's what's important. Let's not confuse peacemaking with peacekeeping because they're not the same. The Bible teaches us as Christians there is a boldness to harness that comes from the Holy Spirit where we can step outside of what we think is comfort and go into places to make peace where there is no peace. Peacemakers are powerful. There was this guy, um, his name was Nelson Mandela, peacemaker. Wasn't tolerant. He didn't ignore things. He didn't avoid it. There was another guy, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., peacemaker, pretty powerful. And Corey Ten Boom, survivor of the Holocaust, peacemaker, pretty powerful. What I love about their stories is not just that they were peacemakers, but if you read Corey Ten Boom's story and you read about her experience during the Holocaust and this this brokenness before God to say, I don't know how to get out of this, God. I need your help. You read her story and you read about this holy submission to the Father that says, God, if you don't do it, there's no way we're going to get out of this. You read about her story and how she's used her story to inspire other people. Like, there is, there is such a, there's such a divine, there's, there's such, just such a, uh, just this holiness about her story. If you read and you research Corey Ten Boom, that just shows us how powerful it is to be a peacemaker who submitted to God's authority. Heidi Baker says it like this, peacemakers are the mercy of a God to a sinful world. They embody his kindness. We're gonna pray here shortly, but I wanna read this first. John 14, verse 27. With this idea that the Prince of Peace gives peace. Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. What is this peace, Jesus, that you're leaving with us? What is this peace that you're giving to us? Here's the peace as it pertains to the entirety of the gospel. It's that sin came into the world and caused the division between us and the Father. There was a rift where we could not approach God because we were too sinful. And God says, well, there's a sacrifice that needs to happen in order for us to be in this close relationship. And so God sends his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins to be the atonement on our behalf. The Bible says when that happened, as Jesus died on the cross, the veil that kept us from approaching the Father was torn in half, and now we have access to him. Here is the peace. The peace is that we've been reconciled to the Father, that we can approach his throne with the confidence, knowing that he's going to help us in time of need. This is the peace that we're talking about. Can you imagine if God was tolerant of our sin? And said, ah, we don't need a sacrifice. Let's just not pay attention to it. It wouldn't be here. Can you imagine if God was like, oof, if I'm going to go deal with this, i got to send my son Jesus? Oh, that's too hard. Mm, good luck, guys. Peacemaking requires movement on our end. Peacemaking is bold. Peacemaking requires action, but it's action that's spurred by submission to the Father and seeking his wisdom and discernment on how we ought to make peace. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians. Here's our response to the message today. He says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. So all is from God who made peace with us through Jesus. And he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 
he gave us this peace. The ministry of reconciliation is that we can be in relationship to the Father again. That's the ministry of reconciliation. That God was making peace with the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us, the church, the message of reconciliation, the message of peace. God has entrusted us with this message. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you. Implore is just like a really big word for like, come on, you can do it. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. This is my favorite verse, 21. Because God made him who had no sin, Jesus, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Here's the message of peace. That God made peace through sending his son Jesus so that we could be here today and worship him. So that we can know peace. God has done all of this. Sent his son Jesus to die on the cross even when we didn't deserve it for us to know peace. And now God has entrusted you, experienced church, with the message of peace. Not for you to hold and to harness, but for you to be ambassadors, to carry the message of peace with others. That they can be reconciled to the Father. And Jesus has already paid the price for it. They don't have to do anything. Would you stand with me as we pray this morning? I know earlier today we said, hey, let's do 20 seconds of prayer where we pray for someone, right? That person that we usually try to avoid. And maybe you prayed for 20 seconds. I just have a feeling that after hearing all of what the message of peace actually is, that your prayer might change a little bit. And so I want us to respond first. First, praying for that person that you had prayed for earlier, but now knowing that the message of peace, blessed are the peacemakers, is literally to carry this message of the gospel, I'm going to ask that you pray for them again. The next 20 seconds, we're just going to intercede for them. And let's see, maybe that prayer has changed. Here we go. Let's just see around the room. Did your prayer change at all for that person? Yeah, I see a couple of head nods, a couple of hands up. This is the message we've been given. Blessed are the peacemakers. Talking about reconciliation to the Father and to people. This is what God has entrusted us with. And I don't know about you, but I 100% believe the Bible. I believe that God is real. I believe that one day when I get to heaven, I'm going to have to answer for all that God has entrusted me with. And not just things, but people that he's entrusted me with. And here's my fear. I have this, this absolute fear. Not that I'm afraid of God, but I have a fear that when I get to heaven and he asks me to report on everyone he's entrusted me to, man, I'm kind of a... I don't know if you guys, like, get the gravity of that. God is, you're going to stand before the Father. And he's not going to judge you based on, like, <laughs> he's not going to judge you based on, like, the things that you've had. He's going to judge you on the people that he entrusted to you. Like, did you carry the message of reconciliation to the people that he's entrusted you with? And honestly, that scares me. <laughs> Because I know where I am with the people in my life. And in all honesty, I'm not 100% on this. And so our next response is actually a prayer of repentance. We're going to say today, hey, God, like, 
man, you've entrusted me with this message. And in all honesty, I haven't been doing a good job of it. Like, I need you to help me to carry this message of peace to my family, to my home. I need you to help me carry this message of peace to my coworkers. I need you to help me carry this message of peace to my friends. And so let's just take 30 seconds. Whatever that sounds like. A prayer of repentance is literally saying, God, I've been doing it my own way and it's not working. Like, I'm sorry. I need to submit myself back to you. I need to be focused on what you're calling me to do. And so we're going to pray 30-second prayer of repentance for not having carried this message of peace to those around us. Whatever that sounds like in your own voice, in your thoughts, we're going to spend 30 seconds just praying that. As the team leads us in this last song, maybe there's a relationship that's been challenging and you know you need to reconcile that relationship and to be a peacemaker in it and you just need help. The team is going to be in the back. We'd love to pray with you. Join our faith with yours to see God move to cause you to be a peacemaker.